you will need no introduction to him. You'll be well aware of the fact that he's been working here for a, a number of years now. But what you may not know is that Humphrey um, did qualify from UCD, but I don't think Trinity will hold that against him <laughs> at, <laughs> at this stage. And he um, had a very distinguished undergraduate career. He, fortunately for everyone, decided very early on to specialise in gastroenterology, and he worked and undertook research for a number of years in England before returning to Ireland. There he took up a consultant post in Tullamore in 1989, and remained there until 2002. And we were lucky then to be able to um, drag him from Tullamore and bring him here in April of 2002. And he's been a consultant here and, of course, in um, the Adelaide and Meath Hospital in Tala as well since that time. And during his time, he has continued a very active research career. He has multiple publications and presentations to his name. And he's been actively involved in undergraduate and postgraduate training and for the, to this end, he was awarded a clinical professorship in 2009. Despite all this, he has continued to have a very patient-centered approach at all times and is respected by everyone for all his clinical excellence. I have great pleasure now in introducing him to deliver this lecture. Thank you, Humphrey. Thanks so much, Catherine. It's a great, great pleasure and a great privilege to be asked to give this uh, auspicious lecture on the tercentenary of Trinity College. Um, we mightn't be able to go back 300 years here, but I can bring you back, I suppose, 150, 160 years. When you come in the entrance of the old hospital, this is the ground floor plan of the NACE workhouse and a plaque to commemorate those who perished there during the Great Famine, 1845 to 1849. And as Dermot says, the origin of this hospital has to do with looking after the poor and the ill of the locality. Fast forward to where we are now, to the entrance of a new fine hospital that we stand in, and it really is a credit to see where we've come from. The amalgamation we have is with this uh, tremendous university. I can't pick out where the anatomy building, I think it's back there somewhere. Um, but it, it seems like uh, uh, opposites attract or uh, is it a marriage of convenience or whatever, but I'm sure the two go well together. And when I set out years ago doing gastroenterology, I was inspired, I suppose, by meeting up with a a colleague, Professor Oliver Fitzgerald, who was Professor of Medicine in St. Vincent's University College Dublin, and he, more than anybody else, I think, directed me towards a career in gastroenterology. And as it was put then, 30 years ago, uh, this was a specialty where you could combine clinical teaching and research, and the idea was to do a third of each if you were to achieve what you wanted to achieve. Uh, it seemed easy enough, uh, euphemistically, to do it 30 years ago, it's becoming increasingly difficult to do it now because, in fairness, uh, the way things are moving, the emphasis is on service, 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 and teaching and research get put on the back burner in relation to the work of consultancies. I think that has to be acknowledged. But uh, that being said, it's still possible to take on teaching and research, even in the setting of a busy general hospital. Just to, to give you an idea of the clinical, I mean, this is a very, very brief description, and it, it belies what actually goes on. In this hospital, say, in 2009, there were 5,856 medical admissions, just medical admissions. And it, I want to pay tribute to my colleagues here, Michael Durity, uh, Anna Driscoll, uh, Paul O'Brien, Kevin Moore, uh, Joan Power, uh, who are tremendous colleagues and do... They're the, they're the group who look after 5,856 medical admissions a year or more. In my own clinic, the gastroenterology clinic on Monday, uh, last year we saw 282 new patients, and it's triple or four times that in terms of re review patients. So it gives you, and I suppose uh, the way gastroenterologists these days measure, well, how much work are you doing? Uh, they might say, well, how many endoscopies are you doing? Colonoscopies, ERCPs. Uh, upper GI endoscopies. When I came here in 2002, the hospital did 1,334 procedures in that year. 
in 2009 that had gone up to 2,855. So it's just a simple measure, I suppose, of increasing activity. But, I mean, in anybody's career, there are particular, there are particular uh, people you meet, there are particular events that happen. But I, 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 you'd have to say that in the decade that I have practiced, uh, that a number of fantastic key advances, pure serendipity, pure luck, have come to pass that have shaped gastroenterology and shaped people's careers. I, I picked out three, I'm sure there are others, but this is one. The, the advent, when I qualified in 1977, cimetidine, tagamet, came along and was a huge advance in the management of acid peptic disorders. In 1989, omeprazole, losec, came along, and there have been others since. The advent of endoscopy in 1977 you would do well to get upper GI endoscopy in the major teaching hospitals in Dublin, not in mind it now becoming a, a routine procedure throughout the country. And since then, upper GI endoscopy, colonoscopy, and other fibro optic endoscopy procedures have become run of the mill, have become commonplace in all hospitals. But they, they, uh, the fibro optic endoscopy has shaped gastroenterology no more probably than anything else, particularly those who do so called luminal gastroenterology as opposed to those who do hepatology liver disease. In my, in my own case, in 1982, reading a letter in The Lancet uh, about the discovery of the idea that your stomach could have an infection in it, that the line of the, your acid stomach where nothing could live, the idea that bacteria could thrive on the line of the stomach uh, was anathema. It was a huge heretical suggestion. But it has been more than anything else. But I think it has to be viewed with all these together as, a, as an advance that again has shaped and changed gastroenterology. I mean... Helicobacter infection, 82, it became apparent in 89 through the uh, work of, among others, Colin Morrow, and that treating the infection could cure ulcers to the point that the 1990s was the, Demo talked about various growth times when some, something takes over and becomes the item that everybody's interested in. And uh, that certainly was a time of activity in that uh, infection. But can, can I... In the face of what I've just said to you, can I just describe to you what my own thoughts about the changing stomach as it has changed over the last 33 years, as I see it anyway, when I do hundreds of endoscopies every year. If you go back to 1980, duodenal ulcer was the key upper GI problem causing gastrointestinal uh, dyspepsia, indigestion. And the cancer that concerned people was stomach cancer particularly that affecting the lower or middle part of the stomach. If you fast forward to where we are now, you, you would almost have a party if you find a duodenal ulcer at endoscopy. They've, they've gone. We don't see them anymore. We don't see stomach cancer in this part of the stomach much anymore. Whereas the big concern at the moment is cancer of the gastric cardia. The cardia is the upper, just where it... Uh, just below the esophagus, and esophageal cancer. And, and this photograph here of Barrett esophagus, where the normal skin lining of the esophagus has changed to become like the bowel and is looked on as a risk factor for esophageal cancer. This is, this is, this is the modern epidemic. This is the modern problem in the stomach uh, that we have to deal with. Now, it's to try and understand, well, why has that happened? I mean, there have been changes both in terms of helicobacter infection being less common, the, uh, the uh, epidemic of obesity is upon us, is it lifestyle, is it what we eat? But it is a genuine epidemiological change that we have to take note of, and it has changed how we practice as well. So if you were in the 1990s, uh, again, you could, uh, you could publish away to your heart's content in relation to helicobacter infection. This is a, an, ele an elegant electron photomicrograph of the helicobacter organism, the green little wormy things here, living uh, on the lining of the stomach. And lots of work was done, some of which I was involved myself, eradication, peptic ulcer, gastric cancer, defining the optimal treatment, 
and laterally looking at the relationship between helicobacter infection and gastroesophageal reflux. The, then it led to come forward to where we are now, and you're posed a different problem. Uh, Amr Salim was a, a lecturer in me medicine here and in Tala, and did his MD work uh, uh, on fundic gland polyps. This is a photograph I took about three weeks ago in a patient who was on an acid blocker for reflux for a good number of years, and her stomach is, is populated with these polyps. They're called fundic gland polyps. And as we understand it, they're, they're, they're innocent. Uh, Amer, in his work, wanted to understand the origin of these, where they were coming from. And uh, it, all, all one can say at the moment is that these polyps are occurring more often in women than men. They occur almost exclusively in the helicobacter negative stomach. It's as if the helicobacter positive stomach of decades ago might be in some way protecting against the development of these fundic gland polyps. They're associated very strongly with gastroesophageal reflux disease. That is the disease par excellence where you see these polyps. And there's also the suspicion that they might be driven on by proton pump inhibitor therapy. I know we're having uh, our lecture this evening is sponsored by one of the key makers of PPI therapy, but it has to be said <laughs> that, that uh, they may or may not be impugned in relation to where these polyps are coming from. At the moment, the guidelines we're getting in relation to these polyps are they're innocent, they're never going to do anything, but we're only at the beginning of this. I'd like to come back in 10 years and see this lady's stomach again and say, well, I mean, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be tragic if they were to grow bigger and become cancerous or something? But it is one of the phenomena that seem to be occur in what I would describe as the changing stomach or the changing upper GI tract. Now, again, I don't want to go hell for leather on PPIs, but this is uh, just an idea of well, wh what is happening with those tablets. Uh, uh, they, this is a study published in the International Journal of Clinical Practice. It was a, a one-day blitz we did in Tullamore back in 2001, where every treatment chart in the hospital was looked at for who was on PPIs. And just under a third of the patient population were on PPI therapy, a third of the hospital. I mean, if we do the same ring round here, I'm sure we get exactly the same answer. And I know from other work that the group where they're most uh, ongoing is in older people. When you looked at, well, what were they on these tablets for? Uh, Two thirds were on them for an approved indication. But in a third, the indication was either unapproved or unknown. Uh, people being put on PPIs for non-specific uh, tummy ache or for every reason. But there's a lot of prescribing of that medication going on, which some of which might not, might not be entirely appropriate. But that's I'm not anti the tablets or the company, please. Can I change tack for just a second now to another another aspect of gastroenterology, which I think is very important. And, uh, and, and lends itself to research as well. When, you, when you're doing research as a clinician, you need to have lots of the condition to deal with. And you should ideally try and collaborate with a university department where people have more time than yourself to help with the research. The gut, when it's working right, is a fantastic machine, from the top to the bottom. Esophagus, stomach, small bowel, large bowel, there are a wonderful system of nerves and muscles. You just put stuff in at the top and off it goes. You don't have to tell it to do anything. You don't hear it. You don't see it. You don't feel it. If, if you feel it or see it or hear it, there's something wrong. And for the most part, when we do tests and find nothing, what's wrong is irritable bowel syndrome, which is a condition of recurring abdominal pain, bloating, wind, and altered bowel habit, and a very common condition affecting about 1 in 10 in the population. And just bring you to the next thing. The HSC Primary Care Reimbursement Service. This is the group of people in the population who have medical cards, who get their tablets for free, where medication is free to about, medical care is free to about 30% of the population, it's means tested, it, it accounts for about 70% of prescribed medications by GPs. So if you want to find out what's being prescribed, go and look 
at the reimbursement scheme. The patient brings their prescription to the chemist, and the chemist won't get paid unless he fills in the forms, so the forms are filled in accurately and properly. The age gender of the patient is given, the details of the medicines dispensed, and the pharmacy dispensing fees, so they can send their form back. So you might say, well, what, what, if, what has irritable bowel syndrome and medical cards got to do with each other? It's a way of understanding what's being prescribed for the condition. Now, I want to pay tribute to, uh, God rest him, Professor John Feely, who died last year, who was Professor of uh, Pharmacology and Therapeutics at St. James and Trinity College, and a fantastic man who was humble, extremely erudite, intelligent, fantastic output of work of all sorts in pharmacology and therapeutics. And when I started here in 2002, I went to meet him and give a presentation to their department and wanted to collaborate with them because I could see a way of, through their, through their work, of what they were doing, of following gastroenterology and gastrointestinal prescribing. And in relation to irritable bowel syndrome, we published this just last year, about significant <coughs> psychological comorbidity exists in irritable bowel syndrome, a case control study using the Irish HSC pharmacy reimbursement database. Kathleen Bennett here has fantastic computer skills and is able to extract the data about prescribing from the HSC database so you can follow prescribing trends. And it's a very, it's a fantastic resource. And I was always struck in the clinic downstairs and, and before this of the number of people with irritable bowel syndrome who might have mental health issues or who were on different mental health tablets. And, and it, it lent some credence to the idea that stress and lifestyle and so on might have some impact on irritable bowel syndrome. And we did this study where uh, we defined our irritable bowel patients as those who were taking medication like antispasmodics, colofac, boscopan, and so on. So that was, that was how you said a patient who was on that for more than three months had irritable bowel syndrome. And then you went and looked at what else was prescribed. And in the year before they were prescribed their colofac, if you look at antidepressants, anxiolytics, antipsychotics, hypnosedatives, all these things were much commoner prescribed. The, the, the red bars are the IBS, the yellows are the control patients. All those medications were significantly more prescribed in the irritable bowel syndrome uh, patient in the year before they went on medication. Similarly, when you went and looked at the year after they were put on medication, the same idea. So th this concept of co-prescribing, I mean, I don't quite understand, well, what does it mean? Is it chicken and egg? Which star? Is it your brain causes your gut to rumble? Or is it the other way around? I'm not sure, but it, it does, it, it adds weight to what we see in clinical practice. And we've, we've, we've tracked prescribing in other ways as well say, looking at the management of dyspepsia in primary care that was published a few years ago. Rofecoxib was supposed to be the greatest, the latest and greatest, it's called Viox, when it was brought in for the treatment of arthritis. It was going to do your joints good and leave your stomach alone. But it had to be withdrawn because it was causing heart and stroke problems. And we looked, we looked at, well, what what happened when this thing went off the market because it, 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 it dropped like a lead balloon. GPs just abandoned it and we looked at what else they prescribed. In fairness, a lot of the patients who were on rofecoxib got nothing instead. You wonder in the first place, well, why were they given rofecoxib? Some were given paracetamol, some were given alternative non-steroidals. And more recently, we've looked at immunosuppressants in inflammatory bowel disease. And there's, there's, there's more to be done as well, I'm sure. So that's uh, and and it's a great tribute to the Department of Pharmacology and Therapeutics in St. James's and Trinity uh, and that collaboration uh, to allow that sort of research work uh, to, to get done. Can I turn a second to teaching then? <coughs> now, I don't know what your idea of the ideal medical student is, but if you saw this specimen coming down the corridor on a Monday morning for the ward round, I tell you, you'd, you'd run a mile. Uh, now, I was at the um, I was at the RCSI graduate uh, conferring last summer, and the students who, who get conferred have to give a declaration. They all call this out, out loud. And 
they, they say things like, to consecrate my life to the service of humanity, practice my profession with conscience and dignity, the health of my patient will be my first consideration, maintain the utmost respect for human life, and the one I like best, give my teachers the respect and gratitude is their due. But this is, isn't that the ideal result when you've brought medical students through four or five or six years college, that they end up with all sorts of ideals that they'll take through life? I mean, that's what you want. And um, these are factors. If you look at medical education, I'm not a medical education specialist, but you don't, when you've dealt with students and taught for years and years and years, you get an idea, well, what's going to be, what's quality and what's not quality? What's been accepted to reduce quality is overloading facts. Passive, large group teaching. <coughs> fragmentation of the course. Reduced self-learning and development and reduce student evaluation. Now, if you want to improve quality, intensive small group interaction, problem-based learning, in other words, show them the patient and then fill in the gaps of biochemistry, physiology, pathology, pharmacology, etc., around that particular problem, and group learning. Mentoring, the idea where students just feel as if somebody knows them and looks after them and cares for them. They know your first name, or you know their first name, and you call them by their first name. Interdisciplinary contact, in other words, they meet all sorts of people, OTs, speech, physio, nursing staff, discharge planners, everybody. Diverse educational settings, that they're not just in a, a major teaching hospital, they divert out to hospitals like this uh, and other health care institutions to broaden and intensify their experience. And I, I believe very strongly in that particular approach to teaching. I came across this quote when I was doing the work for this lecture. Richard, I'm not sure who he is, but this was in 1988 in the BMJ when there was again a, an intense debate about medical education in the UK. If medical students are losing out today, patients will lose out tomorrow. And that is, that is the truth, because these are the doctors of the future. And a medical council review of medical schools in this country almost a decade ago now, which was a, was a critical uh, report that highlighted what needed to be done, uh, highlighted critical lack of capacity in clinical training, urgent implementation, implementation of measures to improve clinical training capacity. And that's to some extent why we're here today, uh, affiliated in such a tight way with uh, Trinity College and, and delighted to be that. So that you end up with graduates who are fit for purpose and have greater professional versatility. One of the things about a medical career is how much it changes and the ability to keep pace with that change is a very important facility to have and to teach people to have when they qualify. Following on that Medical, medical Council review, Professor Patrick Fottrell from Galway published the Fottrell Report on Medical Education, a new direction, calling for professionalism, the ideals that we talked about earlier, in undergraduate medical training. And again, radical reform of the quality and capacity of clinical training, diversity of clinical locations, strong multidisciplinary approach, integration of the core curriculum and clinical training. And that, that really is what we're trying to strive for here. You might say in a smaller teaching hospital, what's, well, what's on offer? Closer patient contact, small groups, mentoring, develop clinical problem solving, appropriate attitudes. It complements, and it's important to say this, that we're in no way competing. We must strive to complement what is being done in the other teaching hospitals, in Tala and in St. James's, because it's in complementing, not competing, that we end up with a better quality student at the end of the day. This is direct feedback. Uh, Catherine already alluded to this, and Dermot as well. Uh, I had recent <coughs> email from uh, one of our colleagues in Trinity in the, and this is, this is quotes now, in terms of the atmosphere is welcoming, students feel nurtured, teaching happens consistently, the case mix is varied, high level of consultant input, a sense of being mentored. And I think that's, that's very gratifying for all the staff members who are here at this lecture this evening, for the whole hospital, to, to see that uh, that, uh, that is the feedback that we're getting here. Finally, can I just... Uh, go forward to, well, for the future. I mean, 
this hospital and medical education in the context of its continued collaboration with Trinity College Dublin. Graduate entry medicine is a new buzzword where graduates uh, from other disciplines who get an honours degree go off and do the GAMSAT exam and they can uh, become graduate entrants to Cork, uh, UCD or RCSI or Limerick at the moment. And it, it, it'd be lovely to see graduate entry medicine. And I'm sure Dermot and his colleagues uh, will, be, will be keen to further that. And this hospital, I'm sure, has a role to play in the, in, in the philosophy behind graduate entry medicine, where there's even greater emphasis on problem-based learning, small group teaching, and starting in a more holistic, uh, rather than a didactic, anatomy, physiology, etc. way in terms of teaching. Primary care teaching, to use this hospital as a hub and a spoke to other primary care, uh, primary care uh, practices in the locality. The idea of diversity into community hospitals, even a visit to the local hospice. Strength in research links, which uh, has to happen. And obviously the advent of medical and surgical interns at this hospital, which I think are sadly lacking, it would be lovely to have. Much of this predicates on that this hospital remaining as viable as it is and increasing its viability with a strong medical, surgical and anaesthetic background. And it's with that, can I again thank you for your attention and, and it's a great pleasure to give this talk. Well, thank you, thank you very much for that, Professor O'Connor. And I can agree that the um, the um, disease pattern in in um, gastroenterology has certainly changed over the last number of years. Because when I was training in radiology, yeah. ul yeah. ulcers we were seeing every day, and I had, can't even remember the last time I saw a duodenal ulcer. Absolutely. It has absolutely changed for certain. Now, Professor O'Connor is anxious and willing to um, answer any questions that you may have. So, please feel free. All very clear. Yeah. yeah. Um, Dermot. Humphrey, I, I, I suppose the transition in gastroenterology has been uh, an extraordinary one because Indeed. we've seen the eradication virtually in, 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 in our lifetime of, uh, of, of a condition that used to be a significant cause of <coughs> um, morbidity and mortality. Mm. Um, if you're to put a crystal ball in uh, and, and look at the future, where, what, what, what do you see as, as the developments that are going to change gastroenterology in 10, 20 years' time. Any, any uh, ideas about what might be the big changes? I think the, the advent of laparoscopic... I mean, if you t t again, you've got to view gastroenterology as a medical surgical... It, 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 isolated as a, as a medical specialist. This is one of the attractions, is that you... Uh, it, it, there's a surgical gastroenterology to it as well, and the advent of laparoscopic surgery has been a phenomenal uh, change in surgical practice. Uh, the idea, for instance, that you could take out your colon through a little opening in your abdominal wall is just, is just phenomenal. I mean, there, there are more, I suppose, coming to more non-invasive testing. I mean, uh, getting to places where you can't get with an endoscope or can, with difficulty. The idea of capsule endoscopy to for your small bowel. And now the advent of a pill cam or another pill that can view your colon, the idea that you might be able to image the colon, uh, because if you again look at endoscopy lists, and there's great pressure on endoscopy lists in relation to particularly colonoscopy, um, in the United States at the moment, uh, colonoscopy lists are populated by people who are coming for screening, not people who are coming with symptoms, and increasingly in this country, people are waking up to the idea of colon cancer as a major problem, 2,000 cases a year. And if you flip a coin, that's the chance in terms of whether you'd be dead or alive in five years, 50-50. So a lot of people are coming forward for screening, and they're populating endoscopy lists. And that's, that's, a, that's, an, that's an advance. Um, that's in luminal gastroenterology. Um, in terms of medication, uh, and I haven't mentioned inflammatory bowel disease to any extent at all, uh, we're doing a small amount of work in, in research, and we have a large uh, inflammatory bowel disease population here. The advent of new biological treatments switch off inflammation. But at the end of the day, don't we, apart from switching off inflammation, we need to know what's causing it. So I, I think 
back to uh, the new biomedical sciences, the idea that you might be able to uh, either genetically or environmentally pick out the, it's all very well to suppress inflammation, but wouldn't it be much nicer if you knew what was causing it and were able to eradicate that or change it in some way? So there are my thoughts about treatments, endoscopy, uh, and so on. Hello. Um, in terms of screening, colonoscopy, I know Tala, they've got a screening service and mm. they're not up and running. Where do you see a place in that picture? Well, I, I think one, for me, one of the disappointments is that we don't have the next phase of the hospital. Uh, the planning, etc., has all been done. It's just the air has gone out of the balloon in relation to money. And uh, uh, that, that's the phase where, we, where you'd have had a new two or three room endoscopy unit. It was the, uh, the uh, day case activity phase. And uh, uh, the idea that we'll have that any time soon is remote, Colette, I must be honest. Mm -hmm. But that would be, you need, you, you need to be geared up to a level where, you're, where you have uh, a group of, of uh, skilled colonoscopists in a position to, because I think the rules of the game are slightly different in terms of screening. These are well people coming forward for a procedure. The last thing you want is to cause them any harm. That applies to symptomatic patients as well, but increasingly, it, that, that, those ethical issues become even more important in screening patients. Uh, you must be, do something that's very skilled and very safe and uh, complete. Um, but it's here, and I think it's the way, it's the way um, most colonoscopy will be usefully employed. Less surveillance, less bringing patients back with little polyps um, who might need a colonoscopy at all. Less surveillance, more screening is the way it should, it should be going. Okay. Paul? Thank you. Humphrey, uh, so actually, endoscopy uh, has, has changed medicine. But I wonder, do you think it would be safe to do an endoscopy or should we not training nurses or just send the staff to do it? I think the idea of nurse endoscopies is here, Paul, uh, definitely. I mean, in terms of doing upper GI endoscopy and colonoscopy in the UK at the moment, uh, there, there are nurse endoscopists trained up who can do the procedures. Uh, uh, it is a matter of training and, and practice. Uh, and um, at the moment, I'm not sure that there is a facility in this country to train somebody. I think if um, one of our clinical nurse specialists wanted to become a nurse endoscopist, I think they have to still go to the UK. Uh, to train. But I, I would agree. I mean, um, sometimes your time would be better off, uh, rather than, uh, more usefully employed, rather than doing routine upper GI endoscopy. But I mean, as, as you get older and do things, to do the simpler things better is sometimes the best thing. You know? I, 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 wouldn't, I, I never dismiss these procedures as being trivial. They're all very, there's a lot of responsibility going with each of them, I must say. That's right. Tom? I enjoyed your. Uh, views on medical education and I just thought if you were advising uh, Dermot about uh, reducing oh, the, uh, the uh, medical curriculum, what would you have less of? What would you have more of? What would you have less <laughs> of? Oh my God. Biochemistry. <laughs> Every, everybody, everybody would say biochemistry. <laughs> That goddamn Krebs cycle. Where's that killer? No, I say it, 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 um, it's not less so, but it, it has to do with a more integrated approach. Um, That's a good interview answer. <laughs> <laughs> what do you really feel? Well, I, I think certainly the anatomy for instance, uh, could certainly be a more... Who, who needs to know, know every bone in the body? Who needs to know the course of every blood vessel? Sure, the surgeons need to, those who are going to use them. Radiologists. Just, radiologists, yeah. Well, I mean, but for many practitioners, a large swathe of, of anatomy um, might not be uh, useful in, 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 in clinical practice. Um, I mean, I have experience at the moment of the UCD graduate entry program, uh, where one of my own family is, 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 is going through it. And uh, I, can s I, I think the course is excellent uh, in terms of the, it's very, it's, uh, uh, it's in when they say integrated, again, 
the different disciplines are put together in, in a particular way and there's continuous assessment. So it's a, a high pressured, it's, it's, sort of, uh, it's a lot crammed in uh, and you're depending on people who are a little more mature who uh, have already done a college degree to do it. Um, but we're down to five years in the undergraduate course, four years for graduate entry. Um, but I mean, when you when you when you get to our stage of life, and what do you remember about anatomy? And uh, it, it's a sort of a, it, it's all put together. It is to integrate it, really. Um, I, I, it's very hard to be more precise, Tom. <laughs> quite honestly, um, because. You'd like to take all the good bits, all the useful things from biochemistry, pathology, physiology, anatomy, and, and bring them with you. Um, and try not to learn so much of the useless stuff uh, as you go on. But that's the same. I mean, who remembers what paper was published 20 years ago? I mean, you spent all your time writing this paper, and it's, it's totally ephemeral. Nobody remembers it. Or, even ourselves. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Who wrote them? <laughs> I don't mean to be. I'm not being cynical at all, but I, I think these are reflections on, on the, on the, on practical things, I suppose. Okay. It's Judy Collins. Okay. First of all, I'd like to thank you for your lecture at Thanks, Judy. Which really just gave us a lot of knowledge. I'm speaking on behalf of GP population in the area. I'm certain we take wonderful care of our patients, and I know there's a lot of strain, there's a lot of problems. That's very nice to hear that. Yeah. Thanks and indeed. I think personally I would get a good first year of physics. <laughs> <laughs> That's gone. That's gone. That's gone. Well, we're done with the same problem. Just a comment to make about teaching. I take students from Trinity to be the one. Oh, good. Right. The fourth and fifth year, yeah. And what I, but from our viewpoint, what's great is when we get students who have been in the mix. And so I just have to you know, I just think it's, it's almost like a 3D model where. They, they've been with you guys and they're very familiar with the stuff here and all of this, you know, they know the working and so on. From a general practice point of view, when we're talking about patients and referring them, they know the secondary and tertiary referrals that they're going to. And I think that's a, a great access to have. It's a way of teaching them where general practice fits in with hospital care and vice versa. And I, you know, I know I've said before with Tom that I'd love at some stage if you can really integrate that from the point of view of a patient who send to the hospital that the students might find a way of following them once they get to secondary and to tertiary level care then. Um, so it's something we have talked about previously. And so as I say, I love when I get students who've been through there because it means that they know the local setup in a much more three-dimensional way than they would otherwise. That's it. That's great. That's okay. Great. Uh, okay. Professor. Okay. Yeah, so I uh, just want to do two things. Um, the first thing is to uh, thank uh, our sponsors here this evening, this, uh, AstraZeneca, Janssen and the Medical Protection Society for their uh, kind support of this. And it's a really very important um, gesture on their part, so thank you all very much indeed. And the second thing I'd like to do is to thank, uh, thank our speaker, because uh, I think Humphrey has given us uh, the benefit of his wisdom and his thoughts on, on, on uh, gastroenterology over the years, but also particularly, I think, his insights into uh, medical education and research and its importance in the whole model of, of how we deliver uh, health care. Uh, and so at this point, I'd like to present Humphrey with the uh, Tercetinary Medal from uh, Trinity College. And uh, it's uh, been struck to uh, for, for, for all of the uh, Tercentinary speakers at the Inch Hospital. So, Now that concludes our evening and um, again I'd like to thank you all very very much for coming and also to let you know that we actually have um, some refreshments available now and I'd like to wish you all um, a, a good journey home and take care on the roads, they're a bit icy out there. So have a cup of tea before you go.
Thank you. Thank you.